I detest injustice. Correct. It doesn't matter who is involved. Mm. Okay. It is not just right. We should be able to speak against injustice when we see it, irrespective of who is involved. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and that is why I made it expressly clear in my submission to say I would like to request to be given the opportunity to add to my submission verbally in court. Mm. Yeah. Because I realize the enormity or the gravity of the situation we are dealing with. You know, because what is at play? You know, it's not necessarily Lungu or HH or what. It's the country. This is what people don't see. Okay? Lungu may not leave, will not leave forever. But the implication of the decision will live on beyond that. Uh, HH will not leave forever. Okay, but the implication of what he's doing and what is being done during his presidency will live on. Okay, now this is the mistake that we often make. We don't think like that. People only think about themselves and now. We don't think about what we are doing to the country. That was my motivation to apply uh, to get involved in the case, to point out the dangers of doing this, of, uh, uh, of the path that had been taken. Hi, lovely viewers. It's me again, your one and only Mdati Mpundu. Welcome to my YouTube channel. If this is your first time on my channel, kindly subscribe to my YouTube channel by hitting the red subscribe button down below and turn the bell icon to join the notification squad. Don't forget to like, share, and leave a comment. Tell me what you think about this video in the comment section below. I'll be super glad to hear from you, lovely viewers. Recent development, developments have um, brought worry. Zambia has been in the international media. Mm. Recently, President Haka Inde Ichilema suspended three constitutional judges. Uh, this raised serious issues, especially that these judges were part of a panel that we're supposed to hear uh, former President Edgar Lungu's um, uh, matter before court. There is a young man, a UPND youth activist, Michelo Chizombe, who's taken this matter to the Constitutional Court, uh, challenging the eligibility of former President Edgar Lungu's uh, uh, decision to stand in the 2021 elections and his eligibility and in future elections like mm. the 2026 mm. elections people saw you throw in uh, 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 your heart in the matter mm -hmm. what is your role in this case well i just went in as uh, a friend of the court in the sense that there is a provision in our uh, in the constitutional court act where the court can invite somebody whom they think uh, whom the court thinks is knowledgeable on a, on a on a subject to assist the court in the process of adjudicating on the issues that are before court and when the court does not do that any person that feels that it can be of value to the court in resolving the issues that the court is dealing with can apply and i did file that application uh, and uh, fortunately i was granted permission uh, to take part in the proceedings as a friend of the court the implication of that is i have no interest uh, in terms of the case uh, I've, i'm not supporting uh, i'm not there to defend a particular uh, person's uh, position so so you are not supporting either the petitioner michelo chizombe or the respondent in this case edgar lungu the electoral commission of zambia and the attorney general that's correct so i i, I didn't go there for that because in terms of the merit of the case i think both parties were ably represented uh, the petitioner has his own lawyers and the respondents have their own respective lawyers. So my involvement was basically to try and work with the court to assist the court and be able to see issues from another perspective, not necessarily to replicate the arguments that have been advanced by the parties to the proceedings. 
and, and people have asked me, why did I do that? The, 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 the motivation is quite simple in the sense that I'm quite privileged in the sense that I've been following the history of this country. And as a people, we appear not to uh, desire to move on. We tend to, I think, be comfortable just repeating the same thing as a country and hoping that things will be, you have a different outcome. The reason I moved in, I, I applied, was because uh, what is happening right now is exactly what transpired between 1991 and 1996. Mm. Mm. Explain. Okay. Now, here's a situation, and, and that was the motivation uh, to try and warn the court, to say, court, we've been here before and we are on a very dangerous path. Let's not repeat the mistakes of the past. What do I mean by that? In 1991, uh, I mean, I mean the, the parallels are, are really baffling, mm. okay? Mm. In 1991, President Kaunda was uh, president of Zambia. He was presiding over the enactment or the making of the Constitution of 1991. Yeah. Now, what you also see is that Pres President Ed Galung was presiding mm -hmm. over the amendment of the Constitution in 2016. Now, one of the issues that arose during Kaunda's uh, period was, uh, until then there was no time limit as to the number of times one can hold the office of president. Remember Kaunda had been president from 1964. Now we are talking about 1991. So there was a proposal in the constitution that there should be a term limit. Every president should be, uh, should, uh, can only hold office twice. Yeah. Now the assumption is that you finish two five year terms. Now, that issue came up in 91. Now, how do we manage this process? Because Kaunda had held office more than that. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe three, maybe I think by 91, I think there had yeah, been there about- five terms. Five, five, yes, mm -hmm. yeah, nearly, mm -hmm. nearly five. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, how were we to address that? Because Kaunda still wanted to stand in 91. Mm -hmm. So they came up with a very clever formula where they said, well, for purposes of counting the number of times the president has held office, we will start counting with this constitution. Mm -hmm. Meaning that all the years that Kaunda served as president did not count, it came to zero. Mm -hmm. So the new <laughs> law didn't didn't apply retrospectively. That's right. Mm. So so and, and Kaunda was dealt with as a fresh candidate. As a fresh candidate. So whatever he did uh, before that didn't count. Now President Lunga had the same challenge after the twenty uh, after the twenty. Uh, 15 election. 15 and 16 election. Because in 2016, uh, 20, 2016, they introduced the amendment to the constitution. Now, I think the drafters didn't think so much as to how we're going to treat uh, the number of years that uh, President Lungu had held the office mm. before 20. Uh, 2016, mm, mm. right? So, <laughs> so now the question that arose was, because I think this was a realization after the election of 2016. Then they said, okay, we're now talking about 2016, he has won. What about 2021? Is he eligible? Is he eligible? Because he has just saved from 2015 to 2016. That's right. So how do we treat that period? Right? So uh, what then they did was, you know, there was now this issue that was now a question 
was framed in the case of Dan Pule. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I was a hypothetical question. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so I think this was something that people discovered later on to say, listen, we would like this man to. <laughs> Uh, to stand in 2021, 20, 20 but he has a problem because he has already held office. He's been elected twice in 2015 uh, and 2016. How do we manage this process? So that's how the, the, the case of Dan Pule arose. Mm. So it was basically a creative way to try and erase the period served before. That's why you are saying this. The, the parallels are similar to 1991. Exactly. Mm. So, through the Dan Pule case, President Lungu managed to erase the number of years he served before 2016. The 18 months he served. Yes. So, mm. through that interpretation, very creative interpretation. By the way, I, I was involved in the case. So they achieved a very, uh, they basically erased those number of years so that the first term effectively started with a 2016, 16, putting him in the same position as KK, KK so that the first election now was 20, 1991. Now, fast forward, we are now in 1996. Kaunda wants to come back. We are now nearing 2026 and Lungu wants to come back. You see the parallels yes. there? No, no, they are clear. <laughs> so, now, Chiluba, because Kaunda used the Constitution, Chiluba too used the Constitution. What did he do? What he decided to do then was to amend the constitution. Where now, first, the calendar was bad using various provisions. Mm. It wasn't just, first, wow. they introduced a parentage clause. Yeah. To say, for you to qualify, you must have been a Zambian, and both parents must have been born in Zambia, born in Zambia mm. which was basically an impossible proposition. Mm. Anyway, it went in. The second amendment was, they now said, you remember where the, the 1991 constitution said, for purposes of counting the number of years, the terms were to start with this constitution. That was removed so that the years that were excluded were now into consideration. So as long as you have held the, the office of president twice, you're not qualified. That is how Kaunda was eliminated, other than the parentage clause. There was also this particular hurdle which he had to surmount, where the constitution was amended. So based on the amendment of 1996, mm -hmm. Kaunda was actually disqualified. Yeah, yeah. Fast forward, 2020, <laughs> 24, yes. 25. Yes. yes. We are back again. Mm -hmm. Just like President uh, Kaunda, uh, Chiluba panicked with the return of Kaunda into active politics. Yes. The current president has equally panicked by return of President Lungu to active politics. Mm -hmm. So, oh, what is going on? Now, they've realized that, oh, okay, you came through, you erased the years before 2016 through creative interpretation of the Constitution. So now they have cooked this case, which is now before the Constitutional Court, yes. to undo. Mm, mm. Okay, the I'm sure you can see the parallels. Mm. <laughs> to undo what they, they, they achieved in uh, 20, uh, through the Danupule case, uh, which was repeated in the 
in the Kapala, yeah, Kapala this case. Was, yeah, this matter was settled three times. That's right. And in the, the Danpule case, the uh, Bampi Kapala case, yes. MP4, Katuba. That's right. And then your case, another case that you were involved in, the Sishua Sishua, I think you amalgamated the petitions or separate That's petition, right. Vigo Resource Foundation, uh -huh. uh, Sishua Sishua's case were yeah. amalgamated. Yes. And three times, yes. the constitutional court ruled that Edgar Lungu was eligible. Exactly. So they ruled the first time in Dan Pule. Uh, they stood their ground, they came up with their own ingenious way of arriving at decision, which is fine. Then they repeated the position in Kapalasa. Mm. Then they, again, they stood their ground in yeah. the final case in 2021. Mm. Mm. Now, this is another creative way yeah. of undoing a decision that has been confirmed not once, but three times. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Now you can see uh, most people, for example, I've forgotten the history mm. of between 1991 and 1996. Yeah, and that is why I got involved in the case to mm. warn the court to say, "Listen, let's not go on this path. Mm. We've been there before, mm. and we tend to have this ability to take so many things for granted." Yes. Now. Obviously, whatever has happened, uh, and and the fact that you now have three judges yeah. suspended, right? It doesn't give a good image yeah. in terms of because clearly, uh, what is now happening is that the complexion of the court has changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> but that suspension. Yes, because mm -hmm. what is being done is is a, is a is a very very shabby way, yeah. and and rather indecent way mm -hmm. of trying to pack the court. Yeah. Because what has happened is this. Maybe people may not be privy to this. Um, what happened was after the current president came to power, the composition. The numbers of the judges of the Constitutional Court appointed by President Lungu, I think, was reduced to seven. Yeah. I think some retired, some died. One retired, I think about two of them died. Also. The full branch is supposed to be how many? Eleven? Y yeah, I think so something to that. It has to be yeah. some, some uneven number anyway. Mm -hmm. Now, what did the president do? He appointed yeah. four of his own. So the attempt was basically to water down the composition, of, to yeah. dilute the mm. composition of the court. Mm. Mm. But again, it could only point four. Mm. So you now have seven judges yeah. appointed by President Lungu, and then four judges appointed by President Akainde Ichile. Yes. Now. Uh, <laughs> and of the seven, he suspends three of them. <laughs> That's right. So, <laughs> it's a very shabby way, you know, but in a very, very shameless way where you you just being blatant. Mm. So now you have four, four. Mm. Mm. Four judges appointed by President Lungu, four judges by appointed by President Hakaind. Yeah. Now, that is the composition of our uh, court. But they go further. They realize that uh, you can't sit as eight judges, but mm. seven. So they drop one judge yeah. who was appointed by President Longo. So now you have uh, four against three. Yeah. Okay. And of the three, one had already ruled, <laughs> given minority judgment against President Lungu. <laughs> it was a very shabby, very, very shabby, shameless way of doing things, mm. you know, mm. uh, which I think if there was some element of decency, uh, people would not have done things in such a blatant manner. Yeah. Okay. But it doesn't take a genius to figure out Council, as to where this is I'm, going. I'm glad that you are uh, speaking about this this in a comical way but that's a tragedy then of our judiciary it is um, you cannot have a judiciary revisiting their own decision decisions as in this case you cannot have um, a court sorry to revisit its own decisions i think it's not even provided for in the law no it's not is not and those are the issues that i had prepared to share with the court uh, when I applied, 
I was given only 24 hours, less than 24 hours to prepare. So I, <laughs> I, I normally do a couple of drafts. Maybe I even go up to the 10th draft that I'm satisfied. So I ended up filing my first draft, okay, just to meet that requirement. And then I indicated expressly to say, you know, it, these are cases where you don't pick up submission from the shelf. You have to sit down and think very carefully. Now you have to remember, this is a court where there is no appeal. Mm. Okay? Mm. Once they have decided, that's it, you're done. Mm. And there is no provision for the court to review its own decision. There isn't. Okay? And, uh, and that is why I made it expressly clear in my submission to say, I would like to request to be given the opportunity to add to my submission verbally in court. Mm. Yeah, because I realized the enormity or the gravity of the situation we are dealing with. You know, because what is at play? You know, it's not necessarily Lungu or HH or what. It's the country. Mm. This is what people don't see, okay? Lungu may not leave, will not leave forever. But the implication of the decision will live on beyond that. Uh, HH will not live forever, okay? But the implication of what he's doing and what is being done during his presidency will live on, okay? Now, this is the mistake that we often make. We don't think like that. People only think about themselves and now. We don't think about what we are doing to the country. That was my motivation to apply uh, to get involved in the case, to point out the dangers of doing this, of, uh, uh, of the path that had been taken. Because first of all, I lost the case, not once, twice. Yeah. First, I opposed the application in the Dan Pule case. That same court, you told them that uh, President Nungu was not eligible for 2021. That's right. The second case, you still told them that President Nungu was not eligible. That's right. The third case, you yeah. still told them yes. that President Nungu was not eligible. Yes. But they differed with you. They said he was eligible three times. Yes. Now, the and I think the nation is now understanding. Because the same court that told you that he's eligible three times, now they're the ones that are actively entertaining. The thoughts that you had presented to them when it was not fashionable to do so. That's correct. Now, now it's like but going back to what, what we, we had said. But the point is this. Uh, our courts are not, do not con are not made up of sense. They're not sense. They're human beings like you and I. Are they perfect? No. They make mistakes. But sometimes we have to live with those mistakes. Now, if we say that it was a mistake to have ruled that Edgar was eligible in 2021, and now it is correct to now undo that, which is a better evil. Okay? From a legal point of view and looking at the interests of the country, I can live with the first mistake that Lungu is eligible. I can live with that because I can, my view is that it is a very dangerous and selfish game that we are playing. We are playing with the country in the sense that you see, there has to be finality to every litigation. Okay, I went to court, I lost, I had a position, and I was told, by the way, what I say is not the law, but what the court say becomes the law. law. I respected that, I accepted that. They ruled that Lungu was eligible, and next, Lungu's name was on the ballot. Next, Lungu took part in the election. Next, Lungu lost. Now. Is he eligible to, turn, to stand in 2026? Yes, he's eligible. Because nothing has changed between 2021 and uh, the next election. God willing, he lives up to, to, to that point. Now, to go back and start now beating the courts to change its tune, 
That is what I find difficult to accept. That is what we should not entertain as a car. And it's very dangerous. And my worry is that a decision to the effect that Lungu is not eligible, reversing the earlier decision would destroy the, the court the completely. It would destroy the court completely. No matter how creative they may be in their thinking, okay, it will simply destroy the court. Because the court itself uh, has not helped itself. It has not conducted itself very well. It has failed to win the trust and respect of the people. And I think this will be a final blow. And the people that are doing all these activities or who are behind the, the scheme, I don't think at all they have the interests of the country at heart. Maybe they have the power and they think they can get away with it. They may, they may, and that is why this podcast is important, to be able to have a conversation and warn the people of this country that we are on a very dangerous path, okay? When you go to court, there are two possible outcomes, Yeah. okay? When you go to court, you expect either the court to rule in your favor or against you. You should be able to accept both outcomes. One person will end up crying, the other one will end up uh, rejoicing. It is the nature of our judicial system. But you don't go back, you don't go back and start beating the court. And to, uh, first of all, you don't go back by first of all cooking the court so that it can give you the decision that you, uh, that, that you want. That is very, very indecent. Okay, it's not the way to do it, and that acts against the interest of the republic. Now, that was one of the things that uh, motivated me. Okay, I have no right because I can tell you, for example, I didn't vote for Eddie, uh, for, for for President Lungu in 2021. I didn't. Okay, that is my right. That is my prerogative. I do not have the right to stop him from appearing on the ballot. I don't. He has the right to appear on the ballot, but he doesn't have a right to my vote. That is my prerogative. He has to earn people's votes, okay? But this idea is not, it's happening again. In 1996, we used the law, we used the constitution to stop Kaunda from contesting. Now, we are about to use the courts to stop another presidential candidate from contesting. And that is what I'm warning the country, to say, please, let's make progress. This is not the way we should be conducting ourselves. We have more, far more pressing bread and butter issue to, to consider in this country than getting embroiled in these um, uh, uh, activities that are going on in court. The matters that happened in court and at court yesterday were very sad. First, the number of deployed police officers that had been secured and sealed from Chikwa Court, from the new roundabout where Stanchat has built a new uh, 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 feature there, round up to Intercontinental. The number of police officers that sealed the area was, it's like you were at war. And then something happened in court. When the court finally opened and you began to make your presentations, I think you tried to guide the court first. You stated that uh, the other parties to the case could comment on your submission. Mm -hmm. You had made very fundamental uh, 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 submissions, even warning the court mm -hmm. in the event that they ruled that Edgar Lung was not eligible. Again, mm -hmm. we'll talk about that. But you won the court. So the court started. They allowed the petitioner to lay his case. They allowed Edgar Lungu's lawyers, Bonaventure Mtale and Makebi Zulu, Jonas Zimba to also lay their, their case. Then they allowed the Attorney General and the Electoral Commission of mm. Zambia. And of course you are the friend of the court, the most yes. neutral voice. Yes. And when it came to you, all of a sudden there was just pandemonium in court. Yeah. The judges decided that they would not hear you. Yeah. Yeah. What was that? Ambassador, I've been a practitioner for many years. I have never seen that. And I know that uh, other people have said 
I walked away upset. No. I think I walked away with a sense of sadness and a sense of shame. Uh, it was more about sadness, really, because what transpired in court, <laughs> even as a matter of common sense, should not have transpired. Now, the point is this. The court, you know, at the end of the, first of all, you must understand the gravity, the, enorm the enormous powers that are vested in this court. Matters begin and end in this court. There is no option for an appeal. In a court like this, common sense would dictate that judges should have a somewhat liberal approach. The other point that, that you, you should have at least be friendly, allow people to address themselves. First of all, in terms of the amount of work, those judges, those 11 or whatever, 7 or 8 judges, have no work, first of all. They have no work. A single judge of the high court, okay, has more cases in a year than the entire constitutional court. Now, obviously, they have more time at their disposal. But this attitude or the, the attempt to curtail everything, that was very sad for me. Now, the point is this. I may have made submissions to the court. Those submissions are on record, which means the court will consider them. Right? Now, there is no way they would consider those submissions without input from the other parties. Yeah. Okay? Because the other parties would be perfectly in order to say, court, you decided on an issue or took into account issues that were given to you by, by a friend of the court, but you didn't allow us to comment on that. And that in itself would render the judgment, that, that in itself would taint the judgment. Now, first of all, nobody has a monopoly of wisdom. What the court should have allowed, I gave them my views, and I would love to believe that Attorney General had his own position on the issues I raised. The lawyers for the petition had their own position, which the court would have been uh, enriched by the diversity of views. That is how we grow our jurisprudence and everything else. But it comes down to what we've been talking about, the experience. Any person that has conducted, who has been involved, who has carried out, who has been involved in trial advocacy, who has conducted trial, will tell you that there was absolutely no reason for the court to have curtailed the parties. The parties should have been allowed to address the court. Now, in my case, for example, as long as they had accepted my submissions, I had standing to address the court. But what transpired was very sad, yeah. very, very sad. I feel sorry, I'm, people said I was upset. No, I just feel sorry for the court. That's the unfortunate uh, uh, situation. If why, why wouldn't they hear you? I have, I have no, no idea. For example, they've said they will come up with judgment on 10th December. Exactly. So that means there was time. Exactly. Okay, we could have heard this case. Uh, 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 we, I mean, it's just baffling. This is a critical, fundamental constitutional issue raised, which was heard in uh, less than three hours. Yeah. It just doesn't make, make sense. sense. I, 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 you know, when the court starts, I, I was doing a verbatim, and I not, although they excluded me, by the way, the court, I don't know who gave instructions, serious <laughs> instructions to the police. All the police from all the gates told me that they flagged my name and that I shouldn't be allowed in that court. Now, but when you look at the verbatim, the judge president gives you 20 minutes. Again, I don't know if there was need for time limit. No. I thought the argument should have led. 
You see, I mean, and then when it comes to you, you are not given zero minutes. Yeah. Now, I'll tell you, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 if I get my statistics right, yeah. uh, I think I've just forgotten the, 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 the number, the cause number. But I can tell you that per year, the Constitutional Court has less than 40 cases in a year. Yeah. In a year, than in the a year, thousands at a, eh? than the thousands last time we had discussed. Yes, the court judges. How, how do you justify that kind of behavior? How 11 judges now, of course, there are eight, and you have less than 40 cases. If we can divide it, then it works out to about five cases per person per year. That is a drop in the ocean compared to what high court judges are hearing. Mm. Now, but even if that was not the case, with the full knowledge that there is no appeal, mm -hmm. there is no way you would constrain the lawyers. You have to allow them to exhaust themselves. Yeah unless maybe they start repeating then you cut them short so you've already made that point but to simply stand up and say you have 20 minutes mm -hmm. irrespective of the complexity of the issues involved mm -hmm. i mean it's like you're going there as a formality yeah it's like uh, it's something is already uh it, you just want to go and tick the box yes i yes. appeared before court and i was heard mm -hmm. now one of the reasons one of the issues that i often talk about is that first of all the court does not and should not operate in a vacuum there are laws yeah. there are laws that guides them yes and, and regulations yes article 18 of the constitution guarantees each and every person that appears before court a free and fair hearing before an independent and impartial court, court. That's, that's it is a constitutional right now will it be fair for a person to be given 20 minutes to argue his case i don't think so given everything ever, all the factors considered mm. there is no way such a behavior from the court can actually be justified that kind of behavior actually undermines the constitution what was the rush the court could have continued the court could have sat even in the afternoon what was the rush yeah okay but what is even worse was what transpired in the days earlier uh, was it the previous week mm. where lawyer for the petitioner for the respondent was given an hour to prepare and file for the court application <laughs> i was coming to that so um the main respondent in this matter edgar longo raised concern over three judges and he applied uh, first of all, he reported them to the JCC because he felt the issue of recusal is a judgment call. These people, these judges know that uh, the, their proximity to the head of state and their proximity to the case with the concerns he raised, they should have, without prompting, recused themselves. So he filed in an application with the JCC on that concern. And then he came with an application to seek what you call leave, permission from court, that he wanted to bring an application for the three to recuse themselves. The judge president that she had previously provided a dissenting judgment. And in their view, in the view of President Lungu, he didn't think that uh, she would change her mind on that and that she would not abdicate or vacate her earlier positions. For the other two judges, are their relationship with the head of state? What do you do in circumstances of recusal? I thought that's a fundamental issue mm. to a right to a fair trial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> you know, the, the 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 problem is we take a lot of things very lightly yeah. in this country, and that is basically uh, what may account for where we are uh, sixty years on after independence now 
Let me try and explain this thing. I've just yeah. talked about Article 18. Article 18 is non-debatable. It things very lightly in this country. And that is basically uh, what may account for where we are uh, 60 years on after independence. Now, let me try and explain this thing. I've just yeah. talked about Article 18. Article 18 is non-debatable. It is a right of every person that appears before court. Yeah. That person, if first of all, he has the right. The court is not, uh, it's not me imagining this. Article 18.9 clearly states that you are entitled you have you you are entitled to appear before a court that is independent and impartial. most impa importantly impartial that is one when you appear before this independent and impartial court you are also entitled to a fair hearing the first portion defines the character of the court. That court must be impartial. Secondly, fair hearing. It is now talking about the conduct of that hearing. It's not just a wishy-washy kind of hearing, but it has to be fair. Fairness will be determined on the, based on the facts of each particular case. Let me draw some parallels here. When we say impartial, Ambassador, you know, it's like you want to go to surgery. The operating room must be sterile. It's non-negotiable. Non-negotiable. Mm. Okay? There should be absolutely nothing, nothing to contaminate the patient. Because you're going to open up the patient. That is why everybody wears uh, sterile uh, 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 clothing and equipment is sterilized and everything, so that there should be no subsequent contamination. Now, if you as a patient, you say, oh, I'm going for surgery, I would like to see the theater where I'm going to be operated in, you can. Mm -hmm. And you have to be satisfied. It's your life at stake. It's your life. So if you see molds in the ceiling, it's already a problem. Mm. If you see some rust somewhere, it's already a problem. Okay? So there should be nothing to compromise the operation. That is the same level of what is expected before the court. That is the standard. There should be absolutely nothing that will contaminate the final decision of the court. Okay, and that is why judges do take oath on the Bible. Mm -hmm. When you take that oath, you are taking it before God and before man that I will do my job. That's the commitment. Now, the problem is that people don't take this commitment seriously. They just parrot them without thinking what the implication is. And there is even a requirement, Ambassador. Mm -hmm. When you appear before me, I must make a determination. Will I be able to give the ambassador a fair hearing? If I am not able to do that, I ought to decline. I must decline. I should be able to say, you know what? Given my experience with you, I don't think at all I can be objective. I can be impartial. I mean, I, over my years, uh, over the years, I've had experiences like that. I was dealing with one case where we went before this judge, uh, the same parties, we went there, the judge decided the case, we lost that case. A few months later, another case arose between the same parties. We went before the same judge. Then the judge said, wait a minute, why does uh, the names of the parties sound familiar? Mm -hmm. And the judge, and we said, the judge, yes, judge, you have heard a case before some three months earlier. You know what the judge said? I said, no. 
I'm not going to hear this case. I've already formed my opinion mm. over these people. I cannot again sit and decide another case because I cannot detach myself from the views I've formed in the first case and I cannot say uh, by somewhat by some magic I will unlearn what I learned in the first case the judge refused mm. and said take it for reallocation mm. very simple yeah. we didn't apply and you didn't complain no we didn't mm. 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 the judge on his own motion he called the parties no, I'm not going to hear this case. I've already ruled one case between these parties. With these similar facts. With it, w w yeah, it has something to do with the same or whatever, but I'll not hear it. We took the case to another judge who was hearing these parties for the first time. Mm. We had no reason. Now, remember this first case, this first judge is already tainted. Yeah because of the previous experience. That is the standard to which judicial officers are expected to hold themselves to. Now, they, for me, when you're talking about the recusal, yes, President Lungu had the right to make that application because that Article 18 protects him. It is within his own right. It, is within, it was his right to raise that issue you, 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 I'm not comfortable. I don't think at all you will hear my case in an impartial manner. Now, that protection is not for the court. It is for the litigants. It is for the litigants. The petitioner could have made that application. The respondent could have made that application. And it doesn't matter the time at which you make it. I saw the ruling where the judge says, no, no, no. Uh, they threw back the issue to President Lungu and they said, no, you are forum shopping. You are choosing and deciding which judges should hear your case. I, being a layman, I was rather surprised. I thought they would take into consideration the concerns that you yes. are too close and your proximity yes. to the case may render you may may render your partiality to be doubted yes yes but but the point is this who is complaining yeah okay it's the first respondent is the one who has that apprehension How was he wrong to it? do that hmm. no that's his right now the court's responsibility is to be able to go down to his level is a and quarter, assure him. Is, is a court allowed to show emotions? You know, I did a piece. <laughs> One of the things that rather shocked me yes. was their emotional response and yes. emotional rebuttal and their worry about uh, the matters in the media that their character were impugned no. in no. the media. And no. they were rather emotional. I don't know if you noticed that. Yes, I was in court. I was in court. Unfortunately, those are the issues you take into account when you're identifying judges. Mm. Okay? It's a qualification issue. These are qualification issues. We are not just looking at your academic qualification. We're looking at also what kind of temperament do you have? Are you the emotional type? Or are you one that is able to separate yourself from your emotions and look only at the law and the facts. Based on that test, those judges failed and failed miserably. There should have been no trace of emotion in those judgments because your emotions have no place in a judgment as a judge. Your ju as a judge is there in the law. You are guided only by the facts of the case and the law. Your dislike or dislike of me, your prejudices, your preferences have no place in court proceedings. But if you are not able to detach yourself, if you are not able to separate your, fa your personal feelings from the case, then you are not fit to be a judge. That emotion, those, emo in fact, I mean, somebody even said, uh, we're jo I was joking with somebody to say, well, 
President Lungu's application may have been weak in terms of evidence for recusal, but the judges themselves, through their own rulings, provided better evidence for recusal. Yeah, correct, correct. That was my interpretation because I felt if they are this emotional towards his application citing contempt, taking offense at their character was questions and using very, very strong emotional words mm. against both the application and the mm. respondent. I said, this is a reason they should recuse themselves. Yes, yes. Now, there is another point. There is a provision in the judicial. You see, the problem is that we take these appointments lightly. You know? You know, we're not saying judges must be sent. No. We have to choose the best amongst us in terms of character, in terms of temperament, and in terms of education and experience to rise to the position of judges. And that is why I've always argued that we need a transparent system. Yeah. Now, if we, had no, if we had a transparent system, you'd have seen others coming to say, don't make that one a judge. It's very emotional. That would have been ground for disqualification. But as a judge, your job is to look at... Because you will meet all manner of people. Mm -hmm. You don't choose who comes to your court. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you should have the capacity to detach yourself from what is happening and look only at the facts and the law. Your emotions have no place in the courtroom. None whatsoever. Okay, now what transpired was very, very sad. It, it, what it means, what it shows is that we need to seriously reflect on these issues. Okay. In fact, I'll come to that council because one of the items was the way they handled the recusal application and the next time was the issue of your matter mm. where uh, they, they couldn't allow you to give what you call viva voce. Mm. And besides, you had notified the country in your application that you had submitted skeletal arguments. That's right. People expected that now you're going to give flesh mm. to your skeletal mm. arguments. Mm. But mm. the skeletons is what was <laughs> submitted. But there's another matter that worried this particular hearing mm -hmm. the suspension of the three judges mm. earlier judges you are aware that uh, the president suspended uh, these three court judges i think honorable stali honorable uh, palan mulonda and honorable um, i remember the third judge but three judges were suspended and preceding this when the judges ruled in 2016 mm. on the 14 days, mm. UPND raised the policy that we should complain against the conduct of the judges. Mm. You were involved in that matter. Mm. You were uh, standing in for the electoral petition of President Akainde H. Mm. There have been six complaints mm. over that conduct of the constitutional court judges. Six times. Mm. There are many that complained and after the 2021 elections when president edgar lungu lost elections we are aware of three petitions calling for their removal including the current one mm. by moses kalonde that saw their mm. suspension mm. how are we going back to decisions because the jcc ruled on this matter mm. that you cannot punish a judge for rendering their opinion yeah that a judge when they're working whether they've made a mistake you need to respect that decision but here we are now mm. judges suspended for simply doing their work mm. and what is again like like in the case of the eligibility case before the constitutional court the JCC, the Judicial Complaints Commission, was made to reopen the case that they had closed and shut, mm. and then made recommendations to the president mm. to have the president suspend the three judges. Mm. Your views about this? Yes, Ambassador. Before I come to the issue of race, I just wanted to make la one last point yeah. on this issue of impartiality. Yes, correct. Right? Now, there is an express provision in the Judicial Code of Conduct which places a burden on the judge that if a judge receives a case and there is a possibility that his impartiality or high impartiality is likely to be questioned, a judge is not supposed to touch the case. It's in the law. Wow. 
Okay? Is there someone doesn't need to complain? You don't need to complain. You judges should have the capacity to police themselves. That is what the law expects. You know, Ambassador, as a judge, you have, a, you have the power of life and death over ordinary citizens. You have the power to either re, to de, either build or destroy your own country. And clearly, there is a higher demand in terms of your standing and credibility. That is why you can't just wake up one day and decide, you, 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 you become a judge. No. And that is why I continue to advocate that we need a very stringent, thorough procedure for identifying the right people to appoint as judges. Because of the enormity of the responsibility that is reposed in them. The problem is this, Ambassador. Mm -hmm. A president you can vote out tomorrow. An MP you can vote out in the next election. A councillor you can vote out, uh, you wait for the tenure to end. But for a judge, you can't. They're there for life. They're there until they reach 65 or, uh, uh, or they reach 70. 65 early retirement, 70 they go. That is how we have to take these things seriously. Politicians can mess up, but there is no way we can survive when judges mess up. Maybe we'll tackle the issue of um, the suspension later. Maybe we exhaust this thought, especially yes. that you are on it. When the constitutional judges were appointed for the first time because of the new constitution in 2016, you wrote a detailed letter to the president. I think when it was not responded to, you wrote an open letter yes. and published it. Yes. What were your concerns? Very simple. Ambassador, I understand the enormity of the responsibility that is reposed in the judge. Okay? And that is why, uh, first of all, we have morphed. This country has not been static. We have learned from our mistakes. Previously, what used to happen was, uh, I can graduate from law school today, I get admitted to the bar, I go and run a supermarket. After 15 years, I say, after 15 years, I can be a judge. I apply from running a supermarket to sit on the bench. No practice, no experience. Nothing. No there was no requirement for just that. Just a years. Of yes, the just years from the time that my name was put on the row. I wait 15 years, I can apply. And every year you are just renewing. I'm renewing. Renew but the, in 96, that problem was spotted. To say, no, it's not enough. You need experience. You need experience. It is that experience that you take to the bench. Okay? In other countries, they pick up the best lawyers. People that have proven track records of litigate, of, of doing actual court work. Okay? People that have experience, that have prosecuted cases right from fi filing the initial document, preparing everything, leading up to trial. Running through the... Movie. Running through the, the process. It's not an easy process. Okay? It's not something, a lot of things you, you learn on the job. Okay? And that is why you need a person who has gone through the meal. Now, at the end, and not just anybody, you also have to have, you should have, there should be evidence that you distinguished yourself in terms of trial advocacy, in terms of, uh, in terms of prosecuting cases. And you must at least also have a record of successes before you can be elevated to that position of a judge. Because what is happening, you are simply switching roles from the, where you are sitting at the, which we call the bar, to the bench. So you are only seeing the, 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 the experience from another perspective, but you have a complete knowledge of what transpired. This is the knowledge you go with in the courtroom as a judge. You don't learn on the job. There is, no, there is no opportunity for you to lay on the job. And the Constitutional Court had even provided for requisites for those that would be yes. uh, constitutional judges. Yes. In your view, when you wrote that letter, you felt the entire list of candidates that
that were provided were not qualified. Ambassador, it was very simple. These are the requirements, one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. I had the access to the CVs of each and every judge. I looked at it. Did you meet this? No. Did this? No. But they didn't. And, it, and some of these people that I wrote about were my friends, people that I know. But Ambassador, where the Constitution is, uh, for me it's a no-brainer between uh, upholding the Constitution and maintaining our friendship. friendship. <laughs> I'm say, it's a no-brainer. Okay. You, you uphold the Constitution. I will uphold the Constitution. If you don't like me thereafter, that's your problem. Now, there has been a school of thought that now that these were not qualified, but they were appointed by the President, ratified by Parliament, and became judges, can we have them removed? Well, you, you have to make a case. First of all, one of, <laughs> Ambassador, you, can, you have to acknowledge that there is a problem. Then we have to have a national discussion. How do we address this issue? Various models have been utilized in other countries on how to address these challenges. But the solution doesn't, arise, doesn't uh, reside in uh, arbitrary uh, singling out three judges for punishment okay now but we need a systematic way it is to acknowledge the fact that yes i gave my opinion that is that was my opinion that remains my opinion because i understand the gravity of what is involved now remember this is a case of you see matters begin and end in the constitutional code you should conduct a trial in the constitutional court how do you preside over a trial when you have never taken part in one how on what planet is that even humanly possible in zambia okay because <laughs> in zambia because president naga in 2022 appointed 27 new judges among them four to the constitutional court your young brother makebi zulu took a petition mm. he says most of them were not qualified Again, we are back to the same issues. It's like we learned nothing yeah. from uh, this, your, your case of 2016. And the, the state ignored you. Bulldozers were using numbers in parliament. And the judges became constitutional court judges. Similarly, Makebi Zulu's application and process has been uh, frustrated. Mm -hmm. He lost, and now the people he said were not qualified. There was even a similar case of one that didn't even meet the 10 year mm -hmm. requirement. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. by the time it was going to ratification, mm -hmm. they had done nine, nine, nine years and some months. Mm -hmm. But still, more now they are our judges. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm asking, what do you do? Yeah, I'm, I'm saying it comes down to the issue that I've been talking about. You know, everybody rushes to amending the Constitution. No. What we see is people fighting the Constitution. If the Constitution says 10 years experience, I mean, how do you understand that? Now somebody goes and appoints somebody who does not have the requisite a qualification. How is that the fault of the Constitution? It's not. It's the fault of the people that we elect in office. That is where the problem is. The answer to the challenges that we face is that we must scrutinize the people we elect to elected offices. Okay? Secondly, there must be, if, there's another point, Ambassador. If you look at the Constitution, I can't even, I, I can't remember the exact provision. It clearly states that appointment and promotion to public service shall be on merit. Wow. It's a constitutional stipulation. Now, how can you say, that's why I said, no single judge in this country will ever say, I've been appointed on merit. None. Because there is no system in place. Okay? Because if it's on merit, somebody will tell you, who evaluated you? Okay? Who are you competing against? Because if it is on merit, you could say, well, there are 20 candidates. And they only wanted five, and I was one of the five. Then you can claim that you're unmarried. What system should we place? Ambassador is very simple. It's just a common sense issue. It's very co I mean, how do we do in our own uh, uh, little tune timbers? <laughs> do we just pick up people from the street? Do we? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Even the hire of a man does a process. Yes. <laughs> Even hiring him. <laughs> 
<laughs> common sense. If we can do that in our own homes, what more in public offices? Mm -hmm. Are we not required to set even higher standards? Because these people, they affect the lives of, of everybody in the country. So there should be a higher standard that should be imposed. But it's there in the Constitution. People continue to fight against the Constitution. They violate the Constitution. Okay? The solution is simply to start to look at the people's behavior that we elect. Are they themselves law-abiding? If somebody has been a thug all his life, do you think you put him in an office he's going to respect the law? No. These are the issues we should be looking at. But coming to the point that you, you're raising about the impartiality of the judges, the Constitution already set, has set standards. Mm -hmm. Now, coming to this thing, first of all, the point is this. The Constitution is binding on each and every one of us, by the way. Okay? Yeah. Now, yeah. even when I am called to be appointed a judge, yeah. Ambassador, I have a duty as a citizen or to any public office. I have a duty as a citizen yeah. who has been nominated to check the Constitution. Do I have the requisite qualifications to be in that position? Okay? Responsibility starts with us as a people, as a citizen. Okay? You want to appoint me as a judge? I have to say, I'll go to the Constitution. What are the requirements for a judge? I have to, one, two, three, four, five requirements. Have I met all those requirements? I have to be honest with myself. And if I don't have those, I'll simply say, you know what? Thank you very much for the confidence. Unfortunately, I don't have those requisites. I know of a friend of mine who was also designated to be a, a judge of the constitutional court. Okay, somebody approached him to say, well, there, there is a, a Zambia, your, your home country has just created the constitutional court and they are looking for judges to sit on the constitutional court. What he said, oh, okay, uh, give me some time, I'll get back to you. He went home, checked the constitution he simply says well he needed practice he should have been admitted to the bar but he's one of those who finished school a long time ago and he never bothered to go to ziale and he came back and said you know what i'm sorry i can't take up that uh, appointment i can't even explore this because i don't have the requisite Qualification. So judges, those who are put, there should be a sense of self-evaluation, ambassador, as a people, you know. We should be able to say no to some, even, I know the employment rate is very high, but <laughs> you can't just take up a job and make, your, make, make yourself a joke in the process. It is far more humiliating that way. And you are destroying the country because clearly there are other uh, you can look at Kalaluka. Kalaluka, yes. Uh, oh, they, they like, I must add state council at the end. That of his clothes, you that. <laughs> <laughs> we love titles. Yeah. Anyway, I was outraged because we are making a joke out of the idea of security of tenure. Mm. Okay? And my idea was that, listen, if you suggest that Inchito has committed some crimes, which is fine. There is no statute of limitation. But have him removed from office first. Formally. formally and then after the that, then you can indict him. That didn't happen. Okay? And he went through, I think the case is still going on in court. I don't know whether it has been settled and everything else. So that was the beginning. And this happened after, uh, I don't know whether this was after the... Uh, I think this was before the 20, 20, 2016. This was before the new constitution. The, 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 the amendment to the constitution. But mm. that experience was bad. It was really bad. First of all, there has to be some sense of humanity. Right? Put yourself in the position of Funchito. Would you like to be treated that way? After all, you are, just, you are a public servant. You are working for the state. Now, treat another person the way you'd like to be treated. Okay, so that went on. Then we had the same scenario with Siuni, but other people, I think, uh, and then there have been others, and so, but I think others deserve to be removed. But 
The point is, the, it is the procedure. Should the process undermine security of tenure? Because the way I feel, the way I see it, no judge is safe. No, we talk about the ramification of what we're doing. Mm. But the point is this. Uh, let's look at what has transpired. What has changed in relation to the <laughs> to the to the judges of the of the constitutional court? What has changed? It's the composition of the JCC. Mm. Okay. In the end, the results are dependent. Institutions comprises human beings. What you put in will tell you what results you get. Okay? So that is why we have to take keen interest, even uh, for, the, for the people that are being appointed to such offices, including the JCC. We have to know what is the standing and temperament of these people. What criteria was followed in appointing them? Because at the end of the day, the character of those individuals collectively will become the character of the institution. Those are the challenges that we have. Now, coming back, I have to put a caveat here because I have not seen the, 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 the grounds of the current uh, allegation against the judges. I haven't seen those. But the point is this. That notwithstanding, the point is this. We have a collective duty as citizens to protect our public institutions, not to undermine them. Okay? Now, what has happened to those uh, three judges is very sad. Now, I took part in that case in 2016. I was there. Okay? We filed that petition. Now, you have to understand the dynamics. We have just introduced the amendment to the Constitution in January, 5th of January. Mm -hmm. That petition was filed in, uh, I think, September. September was August, September. This was a new document. The document had not been publicized. No education had been, no civic education had been conducted. No induction or training, I don't think, had, had been uh, conducted in terms of uh, immersing the judges in the Constitution. We were all learning. Now, what happened? What happened was, I remember the first instance that we appeared in court. I mentioned to one of the judges, I said, Judge, uh, by the way, there's a time factor in this case. We must conclude within 14 days. The judge's view then was, I said, no. Our interpretation is that as long as you file your petition within 14 days, it's okay. Okay? So, Ambassador, we are all on a learning curve. We are all learning. Now, as we went, we realized that I think internally there were discussions amongst the judges. And I came, they came to the conclusion to say, actually, they came back to realize, oh, oh, we have actually to complete this within 14 days. 14 days. By that time, the 14 days was already up. Mm. Now, you now say, uh, obviously, whatever happened, happened uh, or, or, or the midnight on that particular day, the 14th day, happened. But in the end, whichever way, we needed to conclude that. And they concluded to say, okay, the petition is dismissed uh, on grounds that are suspect. I've accepted that. Then I heard that, oh, this if petition had been filed against the judges for their removal before the JCC. Now, I said, no. That does not amount to misconduct. Judges misdirect themselves every day. They get it wrong. But that cannot be a ground for removal from office. Okay? That is where I disagreed. Yes, I wasn't happy about the outcome. But do I believe that should be a reason to have them removed from office? No, I don't. I don't. Okay, because judges learn. We make, me, even seasoned judges make mistakes. Mm. Now, the provision of the law are very, very clear. Mm. Now, when you begin to, these, these are the dangers that Zambians need to understand. Yeah. If a judge received a bribe, mm. that's different. Yes, correct. Okay, that has nothing to do with his job. 
he, ha he ought to be removed. Okay? But how the judge deals with his office, how he manages a case, how he misdirects himself, how he confuses himself. That is why the Constitution says nobody can dictate to the judge. In fact, we shouldn't even interfere. Judges are supposed to be insulated as they do their work. Okay? And that is why the assumption is that judges have gone through this rigorous process yeah. of identification. So we have full confidence in them. Therefore, we cannot, from an academic point of view, we can disagree analyze they got it wrong here what what it begins and ends there but at the end of the day ours remains the opinion but what the judge has pronounced is the law okay now we don't realize how how much we are damaging the institution now sometimes uh, as president for example you equally have an obligation you equally have an obligation to protect that institution okay those institutions are key for the functioning of our democracy mm. when you are president for example if i may just digress you also have an obligation to make sure that there is a strong independent opposition party yeah. because that is key for the proper functioning of your democracy you cannot set out deliberately to smash the existing political parties what you're doing is that you are undermining the fabric of uh, the foundation of your democracy similarly you cannot begin to attack those institutions okay whatever has happened should not have happened the problem is this when we allow this you know what we are doing now we are now start reviewing judgments made by the court by an outside body yeah. okay which has absolutely no mandate mm -hmm. so now uh, it, it has happened in i think in other countries in, in 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 western europe where judgments of the court are subject to review by the executive branch of government we don't want to go there whereby judges will have to fear that if I decide this way, this will be reason for me to be taken to the Judicial Complaints uh, Commission. Judge, we must allow judges. Now, in any case, this thing has already happened. 2016, this already happened. We move on. And I'm sure judges have also learned that. It was part of the learning process. Now, the question is, you again, we have to be responsible. What is the benefit that we gain by pursuing these three judges. What is the benefit to the country? It's being totally irresponsible to do that. Okay? It now, actually exposes your plan as an executive. Exactly. Now, here is the situation, the consequence of that. Yeah. Do you know what is happening now? Mm. The number of judges is fast depleting. All the judges, all the judges, are simply crawling until they reach their retirement age 65 mm -hmm. nobody i've spoken to some that they are in their 60s those that i've spoken to nobody's interested in going beyond 65 okay that's that's a serious deal. it is mm -hmm. it is these are the consequences mm -hmm. so oh, what you have now created now you can be 64 ambassador today you get removed you be on the street, no pension, nothing. Mm. There is even no provision to say you get your pension or benefits on a pro rata basis. There is no such a provision. Mm. Okay? Now, you have a guy who has worked all his life in the judiciary. At 64, you kick him out. What does he do? And that is why the first order of nature is one of self-preservation. Mm. So what you have are judges that are not prepared to offend the judiciary. Or what they are doing is that do minimal, don't ruffle any feathers, and wait for your retirement and get your package and go. Yeah. That is how we have reduced our judiciary. Mm -hmm. And given that, tell me 
How many credible Zambians are you going to get who are going to accept to be appointed to the, to the, to the, to the judiciary? Mm. I'll be, you'll be, I, I don't think I know anybody, anybody serious who really understands and who lives true to the ideals embodied in our constitution mm. can actually accept to be appointed judge of the high court or a, a judge of the high court, supreme court or, or, or court of constitutional court under the current environment. I'll be very surprised. Okay. If you value freedom and you understand what it means to be a judge, ambassador, you'll be hard pressed to find credible champions. But those who are already there, they're already trapped anyway. So they have no choice. They can only they can, they can do that. But it's not a pleasant situation. What we now need to do is to start fixing this problem. Mm -hmm. The starting point is that let's create a transparent system of appointment. Of appointment. Everything must be transparent. When there is a vacancy, we need to see an advert published in the newspapers yeah. to say that these vacancies let suitably qualified Zambians uh, apply. Yes. That should apply to every opening mm. in the public service. Yeah. To give a chance to ev each and every Zambian to have a shot. Mm. You know, that is how we begin to fix the process. But now, like I said, now admission as a judge is like uh, uh, some secret uh, uh, process that nobody knows. You only find somebody. The names being, image. Just mm. names image. Not even names. Names if you are lucky. But you just see somebody being sworn in at, uh, at right. Stata. So we have a collective responsibility to make sure that we improve our system. Okay? The shortcomings are not with the Constitution. And I'll keep saying this. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is nothing with the Constitution. There is everything to do with us as human beings. We continue to fight against the Constitution. Okay? Instead of obeying you know what the constitution says you the, the, the equivalent of of what we have you know is zambia mm. is like a church that is refusing to follow what the bible says <laughs> that's what this country is all about and that's why we have we so much chaos. Constitution, no. Yes, exactly. We, we, you don't respect, even when the Constitution says it, you, you have to, this is what you need to do. We still want to find, to, to fight that. In fact, that brings me to the next question before I let you leave, because I know you have a, a, an urgent commitment, and I'm glad that you took time to be with us and clarify these issues. There are two developments regarding the Constitution. Mwangala Zalumis, as our chairperson for the Electoral Commission of Zambia, has set up an electoral reform technical committee and has appointed chair and vice and the committee. I found that highly irregular because I remember the first electoral reform technical committee was appointed by President Mwanawasa. And actually, Mwangala Zalumis was a chair. It was a presidential appointment, I think, under the Commission of Inquiry. And he, Mwanawasa wanted specific issues regarding elections, especially that it had been a contentious issue in the 2001 elections where he had won by 29%. So Mwangala Zalomis is the chair of, of, of ECZ. Does she have powers to amend her own body? Because that's what she's doing. She has appointed the Electoral Reform Technical Committee uh, and they began sitting across the country to review the electoral rolls in this country. Is it the duty of a, a person like, uh, or appointed person like Mangala Zalomis to reform the constitution or make recommendations to the constitution? Her sister at uh, the uh, National Assembly <laughs> uh, is doing she has announced <laughs> I meant it because she's another woman I don't know if they are sisters but I meant it in that context that she's another yeah. woman so her sister at uh, parliament also has announced her own uh, reforms she says there are non-contentious issues and arising from the presidential speech that was made by the president she says we have to start a process to amend the constitution can creatures of the constitution amend themselves council please just add, i feel that what honorable mangala zalumis is doing is clearly illegal mm. 
Ambassador, it doesn't require genius to know that, that yeah. both sisters are dabbing in lawlessness, yeah. you know, which is very sad, okay? When you're a public officer, you occupy public office, the first thing you must ask yourself, even if you have an idea, no matter how brilliant it is, ask yourself, do I have the power to do what I want to do? Let me check the instrument that constitutes my office. Does it give me the power to do that? If it does, then you say, hey, this is what I'm going to do, and I'll do it pass one to A, B, C, D. Now, if there isn't such express provision, you can't. What I'd like to know is, by the way, Mrs. Mrs. Zalumis was my classmate at Unza, together with her husband. But I'd like to know, maybe she can educate us. Maybe find a way to get the answer from her. What provision of the law empowers her to do that? Okay? I've checked the law, and I've not come across. What I know is that the uh, Electoral Commission has the freedom to carry out civic education activities. Okay? But not to embark on a campaign that will result in the reform of legislation. First of all, in our system of government, it's very clear. All legislation is initiated by the executive branch of government. Okay? It is the president that sanctions legislation. Now, by doing this, she's dabbing in, an, in the work of another branch of government. That is why the Electoral Commission you're talking about was appointed by President Manawasa. I think if I remember correctly, he must have relied on the Inquiries Act or something mm -hmm. like that. I might be wrong, but it must have been the Inquiry. There is a, even for the President, there is actually a specific legislation which empowers the President. The President can't just wake up one morning to say, oh, I'm going to constitute this. No. The question is, what law? This is how people end up in jail when they leave offices. Okay, because you asked them, listen, what law governed what you did? Mm -hmm. Okay, but even then, uh, the, the, what criteria was used in first of even identifying the people that have con uh, constituted the, the, com the committee or whatever it is? But I think most importantly, when they finish that work, where will they take their recommendations? Yeah. Okay, you can't take it to the president, you can't. That's not your job. Okay, but in any case, there is a specific body that is created in this country whose job is to constantly revise legislation. That is the Law Development Commission. If there is need to review legislation, that is the body that is supposed to be. You make representations to this body, but you don't embark on that exercise yourself. Okay, but the craziest one. And, 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 and the one which I'm even short of words, is that coming from the National Assembly? I mean, guys, there is separation of powers. The National Assembly is supposed to check on the executive branch of government. Okay? And the job of the National Assembly is clearly spelled out in the Constitution. It is nowhere, nowhere is it stipulated that the National Assembly can initiate legislation, especially one of this magnitude that we're talking about. Oh, she's been very clear. Okay. A process was started earlier. We saw a letter from uh, Petauke Independent Member of Parliament, JJ Banda, where there was a proposal and a letter written to the Speaker over what they call non-contentious issues. And now, recently, following the President's announcement, a process has started in the National Assembly where they want to review the so-called non-contentious issues. The, the, um, and who determines Who determines that? What is your reference point yeah. when you say it is contentious? Okay? What is your reference point? You know? Whenever you argue these things, I mean, people should pause for a moment. I mean, I don't want to talk about Ambassador, you can't just dream up whatever you dream. There has to be some element of self-restraint. And not only that, this country, we are clocking 60 years of independence. Yes, yes. Okay? Now, when you are speaker, before you do something, ask yourself, has any of my predecessors done what I'm about to do? If you are the haven't, ask yourself why before you go ahead. 
And if you must, they should be backing. Now, the way our system works is that legislation is initiated, apart from, uh, I think, uh, the, 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 I'm not so sure, I think there used to be some provision about private members uh, bill or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether that is still there in the Constitution. That's the, but even that, it is sponsored by a member of parliament, mm -hmm. not the speaker. Mm -hmm. Okay? So all legislation emanates from the executive branch of government. The executive branch of government initiates that the attorney general puts his signature there then it is taken to the national assembly the national assembly it is formally presented and then the, the national assembly is not a rubber stamp it has to go through each and every provision and where there is need for amendment the national assembly will recommend amendment sometimes the national assembly can even reject the bill but there is no provision. I stand to be corrected. I'm not aware of any provision in the Constitution which allows Speaker to initiate mm. not just legislation, mm. but amendment of the Constitution. Mm. I mean, I've never, I mean, I, uh, I've been following these things, and at least I'm familiar with the history of this country. Yeah. There has never been an, inst uh, an instance like this. But what is supposed to happen? If you initiate that, who is going to check on you? Mm -hmm. Who's going to check on you? Mm -hmm. That is why you have the executive branch of government initiates legislation. The National Assembly checks that. Yeah. It vets that. Okay? Then after that, it approves. It goes back to the president for assent. Mm -hmm. Now, what are we doing? What has stopped the, 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 the executive from initiating that? And that has never, never been the responsibility of the National Assembly. Nowhere in the Constitution is there such a provision. You see, the, I mean, it boils down to this point, Ambassador. Yeah. And this is my plea to Zambians. Let's pay attention to the character of the people we elect. Okay? Let's also take into account the character of people we appoint to public office. Okay? Because who they are is what they will be whilst in those offices. Okay? This is how we begin to fix the country. We have to fix the country by choosing the right people and putting them in the right positions. Okay. Yeah. All okay. these problems you know, and say, challenges. Yeah, they say the president doesn't build the character, it just reveals the Who character. you are. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. The assumption is that when you offer yourself for the presidency, for whatever elective office, what it means that to, this is what we don't pay attention to. My plea is that come 2026, we will focus on the character of the people we are electing. Mm -hmm. We have to make sure. That the person, be, first of all, there are three things. Our yeah. system is tiered, by the way. We have two sets of public officers. Yes. There are those that we elect, and there are those that are appointed. We have a say. The people that we elect, in turn, appoint people. Mm -hmm. Now, once we elect the wrong people, they will in turn only appoint wrong people. Yeah. We elect the right people, they will in turn appoint the right people. Mm. So I'm looking at 2026 as an opportunity to reset the button, mm. to make sure that we elect the right people, mm. the right person as president, the right person as an MP, the right person as a councillor, the right person as mayor. The reason is this, there are two key fundamental to leadership. One is character. Character is very important, you know. And two, skill set. Mm -hmm. The skill. When you are electing somebody as an MP, what skill set does this person have to perform the function of a, of a member of parliament? Or even as a councillor, what does he know or understand about what it means to be a, a councillor? And most importantly, when you elect somebody as president, what skill set does this person possess to occupy that office? 
which will use with so much power that office has power of life and death yeah. on the citizens of this country yeah. these are not things we should take Russell. lightly mm. and at the end of the day you know we have to move away from this attitude of voting based on political parties we should vote based on the best candidate our vote should go to the best candidate that is there be it presidential candidate forget political parties does this person have the relevant character does he have the relevant skill set to perform the functions of the office of president mm. similarly if you have two people two candidates in a constituency from whatever political party choose the best candidate who you believe is going to represent your interest in your constituency that should be the determinant not how many things people give you or how much money they throw around because that money will, will vanish after the election yeah. what happens mm. the same with councillors we elect people who have absolutely no clue as to how local government is supposed to work yeah. so these are the issues we need to revisit that problem appear we've seen it right through our public institution mm. instead of fighting the constitution we have an assignment to do let's first of all choose the right people to run our public institutions once we have the right people in these institutions then we can now be able to determine we have the right people then obviously the shortcomings are coming from the constitution yeah you can't put the wrong people and then they do wrong things you blame it you on blame the constitution, the constitution yeah. it's just crazy like we are seeing. yeah that's what we have specialized in um your last words i want you to include this the matter we started with the constitutional court and the matter of eligibility for edgar longo you are given startling uh opinion of what would happen if they ruled against edgar longo because you warned that the ramifications are great just speak to that yes you see <laughs> You know, these are the things that I'd have loved to share with the court, and the court will have had the opportunity to go and think about and be able to reflect this in the judgment. Uh, the, 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 the problem is this. Our constitution is very clear in terms of how you challenge the outcome of an election. There's a two-phase process. The first process is the nomination process mm. right if you recall in the case of dan pule when they posed that question i said no you cannot deal with this issue we have to wait until 2021 until nomination until time. nomination because uh, there is already a mechanism in place to deal with the eligibility of a person to contest the presidential election and that is contained in article 52 the same article 52 that people are advocating for you for 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 repeal the constitutional court overruled me and said no we have just been moved to interpret so we can interpret any time mm -hmm. okay fine now you remember i had made several pronouncements yeah. to say i am waiting for president lung to file his nomination in fact my petition is ready mm. it's just it's already on it's in the drawers <laughs> <laughs> you remember i spoke about that because i knew the procedure mm. now we went through now that procedure that is why it is very clear that if one's nomination is cancelled for whatever reason the election will be cancelled and fresh nomination will be called that procedure is designed to ensure that when you have election that election comprises a candidate that qualify okay that is why you have seven days within which to challenge the validity of any candidate of any candidate's nomination okay when that seven days expire and you don't okay it means you have no issue with the nomination of that candidate the nomination of that candidate will never be raised again 
that period of seven days has expired and the court when when you challenge the court has 21 days mm. to determine that but you have seven days mm. when that seven days expire you don't challenge that right to challenge the nomination is forfeited is lost for good then you go into an election the ballots will be printed then people will vote the second level of challenge you are challenging now not the nomination but the outcome of the election mm. okay mm. then you now be saying this person was not validly elected okay you can allege they were vote buying what and what what and what or there was some violation of the law relating to the election mm. not nomination mm. then the court has to hear that petition at the end of that petition the court will say yes you've made a case we nullify this election and what happens you go for fresh elections you start the process all over then the court will say no this person was validly elected mm -hmm. that's the end of the chapter mm -hmm. that issue is closed I've seen some ingenious arguments, whatever, whatever, but the Constitution is very clear. It is that election. So that election. This attempt to reopen whether Edgar Lungo was qualified to stand the 2021 elections is closed. It's closed. But he did, Ambassador. He took part. Yes. So what are you going to do? And what is the value of doing that? He took part. And okay. When you rule that he was not eligible aren't you making that election an illegal election the point and is this ambassador and his outcomes yes the, the point is this first of all we'll come to that so when you do that he's taking part in the election yeah. so he was cleared right his nomination was challenged and the court cleared him mm. a competent court cleared him mm. it was only after that decision in the Shishua Shishua case, that is when now his name appeared on the ballot. The same court that said is eligible. That is why when you read the petition yeah. of the Electoral Commission, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. They said we follow the law. Yeah. The man was cleared. We put him on the ballot. Mm -hmm. We did no wrong, mm -hmm. which is the correct position. But the most dubious one is the one which is now coming from the Attorney General's chambers, which has now done the opposite. The opposite you don't do that there has to be consistency in the position of the law yes the attorney general may change solicitor general may change but it is the office the office never That's changes consistent. yes mm -hmm. the, what was reflected in 2021 was not kalaluka's opinion it was the opinion of the office of attorney general yeah okay now in this case because it boils down to the issue i'm talking about people mm. that we put in offices that is where the problem is not the constitution mm. now you change the people the tune changes as well <laughs> you know so you now have but lungu i mean that's why i fought that case mm. i was convinced i lost yeah. i have accepted that loss mm. okay because i expected things could go either way now lungu took part Mm. what is there to contest mm. it is over mm. there's a legal concept that we use which i have shared with the court where we said the issue is moot mm. the issue is dead the issue of his eligibility in 2021 is dead mm. Mm. there is nothing alive mm. that election is long gone the only election we can deal with is 2026 mm. if you are raising this issue for purpose of 20 wait for yeah. 2026 mm. now these are the problems now okay let's say okay the court is being asked to revisit if the court and this is what i'm saying mm. and my plea and my hope and prayer yeah is that the court does not reverse itself mm. it is in the interest of the country that this constitutional court remains consistent mm. and sticks to its decision because it is the final court
Yeah. It will become a joke mm. if at all it reverses itself. And I've looked at it, there is absolutely no ground, no basis on which it can reverse itself because that election is gone. Now, what are you doing by going back to 2021? We are unraveling things that have already happened. When we start unraveling, where are we going to stop? Mm. Okay, we are now going to say, okay, fine, he was not eligible, fine. But he took part in the election. So, what is the impact of a person that is, in elig is not eligible on the election that he participated in? If you determine that he was not supposed to be there, but he was there. Now that we know he was there, what is the effect of a person who should not have been part of that election and ended up being part of that election? What is the effect? The court has to resolve that. It has to resolve that. I would argue it means that even that election is tainted. And the outcome of that election is equally tainted. And I'm warning the country, is that where we want us to go? Is that what we want to go? We can't, we can't. We can only move forward. If we want to stop President Lungu from contesting the election in 2026, mm. let's do it through the ballot, yeah. not this uh, through this crazy, crazy uh, arrangement that somebody is cooking up. We have to respect the Constitution. The court itself, the Constitutional Court, has an obligation to stick to its own decisions. Okay, but I'll tell you one thing. There is no, throughout the debate, for example, nobody, nobody pointed to a provision of the law which authorizes the constitutional court to do what it is being asked to do. Nobody. Yeah. Okay, because the way our constitution is structured is that as a public officer, whatever you do, you must point to a provision of the law. Yeah. If you can't point to a provision of the law, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. Now, even in this case, the constitutional court must be able to point out to say there is a provision in the constitution which allows us to examine the eligibility of a losing presidential candidate. That's another big point. Okay. Mm. They should point to a provision of the law. There is a provision of the law. Because what the petition has done is to single out one participant in that election and said this particular one was not eligible. Yes. And But the, that candidate lost election. He lost election. So tell me, which provision in the law tells you you can challenge the nomination, you can challenge the winning pre the president-elect, but there is no provision in our constitution to challenge the eligibility of a losing presidential candidate. If there is, then let them tell us what provision that is. Nobody has pointed to that provision. Now, as long as you can't find that provision, the constitutional court cannot do what it is being asked to do. Mm. And if it does that, it will be acting in violation of the constitution itself. And that is dangerous for the country. We do, there is no value, there is no benefit on going on that route. Mm. And that is one of the reasons why I, I, I accepted to come to your podcast, yeah. to sound this warning, mm. Mm. okay? We take so many things for granted. If we must defeat Edgar Lungu, let's do it through the ballot, not this through uh, crazy uh, 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 yeah. But the point is that, I mean, let's, we, we need to learn from history. Mm. It happened in 1996. Let's not let it uh, be repeated in 2026, uh, mm. okay? The Constitutional Court has ruled, Ambassador, if I may push the argument a little slightly further, in our Constitution arrangement, and I'll make this statement very boldly, mm. and I hope that some lawyers will come and challenge me on that, only the Supreme Court is allowed to depart from its own decisions. And even that right is qualified. Mm. Okay, it must be justified in the interest of justice and in the development of the law. Only the Supreme Court. But there is no similar provision in relation to the Constitutional Court. Whatever decision the Constitutional Court makes, it is bound by that decision. It is stuck with that decision. And as a country, we have to come to that reality.
we can't go on and beat the court beat the court until it gives us that the decision that we we want that is the position of the law and we have to learn let's not fight the constitution mm. let's obey the constitution let's respect what the constitution says okay that is the starting point that is the solution to all these challenges that we are talking about okay and, and ambassador we've gotten our priorities wrong mm. This podcast, we should be talking about, for example, the issue of load shedding. Yeah. What kind of uh, uh, somebody is, uh, is celebrating about the fact that, well, uh, uh, what's this? The mineral uh, mapping has not been done in, in, what is it, 60 years or something like that? Yeah. Hey, and somebody is celebrating about the fact that copper mining is booming. Ambassador, we've been mining copper for nearly 100 years. Mm. Mm. We have to begin to have a conversation. Yeah. What is the impact of mining in this country? Mm. Okay? 100 years. Yeah. Nearly 100 years of copper mining in this country. We should have a conversation as to the impact of that industry. Yes, you can see $2 billion and everything else. Oh, they'll put into a... But who benefits from that? Mm. Who benefits? Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So these are the issues, because these are the bread and butter issues. Not Lungu's eligibility to, to stand... Which was settled. Which was settled. But if we're interested in, we can wait until 2016, litigate that. The time is... 2026 time will come. But right now, we should be able... How do we survive this load shedding? Mm. How do we survive? I that should be part of the so national I, conversation. I, I remembered you, uh, the president yesterday was celebrating that there is an investor who put up a cholera vaccine factory and when you, 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 you've been very clear, just deal with the water and sanitation issues and cholera will go away. The solution is not to mask this, uh, 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 these basic issues with a vaccine. In fact, you're creating a bigger crisis. Ambassador, it's like you drop in a sewage. Mm. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't matter how much perfume you want. <laughs> okay. Go and take a shower and change clothes. Yeah. That's the answer. Yeah. You can put in as much perfume as you want, but it doesn't change the fact that you went in a sewage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But these are all cosmetic issues. Mm. And first of all, I mean, <laughs> I mean, maybe it's another com conversation for another uh, yeah. day. We always talk about foreign investment. What? 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 Ambassador, what is the impact of foreign investment in this country? Mm. What is the impact? Like you were saying, what's the impact of mining? Yes. We've been mining for 100 years. Yes. For 100 years, we've been exporting, you know, yeah. roughly 5 to $7 billion a yes. day. What's the impact on yes. the people? What's the impact on our development? Okay. Yeah. Those are the issues we should be talking about. Mm. We, we export, we're generating so much. And how much of that is staying here? Mm. How much is that? I mean, somebody saying, well, we'll create 5,000 jobs and what? Those are just numbers. I grew up in Muflira, Ambassador. That's my hometown. Yeah. Muflira produces the best copper in the world. True. Okay? But go there. Muflira looks like a war zone. Yeah. Yeah. Now, those are the issues we should be talking about. When you are generating wealth, isn't shouldn't Muflira be transformed into a modern city? Yeah. Because that's where wealth is generated. Mm. So these are, these are the issues we should be talking about. Not these are the rubbish about eligibility and so forth. That is all rubbish for me. It is inconsequential. Yeah. It will. Not, it has no impact on the average person. Mm. Okay, that is struggling to make ends meet. Eligibility, there's no nexus between eligibility and putting food on the table. There isn't. Mm. We should be able to talk about how are we going to take care of the most vulnerable people. Yeah. Okay? We are even struggling to feed ourselves. Mm. Okay? Now, everybody's talking about all, all the challenges that we've gone through and everything else. We should be having a national conversation. Yeah. This load shedding thing, I mean, won't go out tomorrow. No. At least somebody should be able to give us data. To be able to say, you know what, we expect the situation to improve yeah, maybe end of 2025. Mm. So that when you are in business, you make a decision. And whether so you want to go in, in business now uh, or wait for 2026 when electricity improves or not. 
But that is the kind of information, that is the kind of conversation we should be having. Not the rubbish that we are discussing here, you know. So, but the point I'm, is... I'm, I'm so glad, uh, Honorable John Esangwa, State Council, that you've come at short notice to alarm the nation at the path, on the path we've taken. I think people have been taking it very lightly. They think, they thought that it's a mere contest between Ed Galungu and Daka Inde Ichileman, both of them now using state power to bar each other. And I'm glad that you've put it in proper context, that you're actually threatening national security and the, the standing of that judiciary may be eroded irreparably. Ambassador, this mm. issue is bigger than yeah. Lungu. Mm -hmm. It is the very existence of the country. Yeah. Okay? If it was about Lungu, I don't even come here. Yeah. Okay, because I think Lungu can take care of, of himself. Yeah. But I'm talking about it is the country. Mm -hmm. This issue affects the country. And we cannot allow, we can't just sit and allow certain people because they're driving their own narrow, selfish, and transient ad agenda to undermine the very existence of this country. We can't. Okay, and this issue is bigger, bigger than all of us. Mm. You know, remember we went through, I keep telling you, we went through between 91 and 96. And my plea to Zambians, let's not allow what happened to Dr. Kaunda in 96, mm. where he got bad through a constitution arrangement mm. for Lungu to be equally bad, mm. okay, through some ingenious arrangement with the judiciary. Mm. We have to speak stop that mm. if we have yeah, we have to stop lungo let's do that through the ballot yeah. let's do that through the ballot yeah. it's already there in any case you know you know the funny thing that i that i see mm. i mean people are wise enough to reject lungo mm. right mm. now why are you doubting them? Why are you doubting them? <laughs> Why have you lost well, what faith? Have you, what have you done so wrong? Yes. That you are afraid of the you are now, of the Yes, people? you are now. You don't have confidence in us, the, ele the, the electorate, that yeah. you will make the right decision in 2026. Yeah. Why are you doubting us? Mm. Okay? So mm. don't use these things. Trust the system. Mm. Trust the people. They'll do the right thing come 2026. Mm. Mm. So oh, wonderful. John Sangwa, we're uh, hosting State Council John Sangwa to discuss issues, issues of um, the Constitutional Court and the matter that is before there. As you've seen, he's very impassioned about the issue of the Constitution. And this abrogation, you go to literally personal injury of him. Mr. Sangwa, I'd like to thank you that you took time to come and share your deep thoughts with the country and the injustice we saw the last few days at the constitutional court i hope that there'll be a moment of reflection those courtrooms are open courtrooms they should allow the gallery to come they shouldn't bar people the issues of recusal i think was a very important issue the matter that preceded their hearing of suspending judges by the executive again that was totally unnecessary and then the personal injury they did to you where they couldn't allow you to speak <laughs> this is a constitutional court that guarantees freedom of expression mm. it, it deals with the rights of people mm. but it was the first one to injure your right to express yourself and and i'm glad that um, I hope there'll be a moment of reflection on that court. So, uh, for our dear viewers, unless you have some last words, honorable. No, no, no. I think we've said a lot because otherwise, uh, <laughs> I don't want to go off uh, tangent. But I think what is important is for people to understand: it's nothing personal. Correct. I have nothing against the judges. I have nothing against. Uh, 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 President Lungu, I have nothing against uh, President HH and all those people that we're talking about. My only commitment is to the Constitution. Yeah. My primary obligation is the love of this country mm -hmm. and my commitment to the Constitution. I take my oath very seriously. Mm -hmm. Okay, I took oath to defend the Constitution. And my appearing before you is yeah. part of the fulfillment of that, is part of fulfilling that constitutional obligation. Okay? And my only plea is this. I think we've become too polarized. Mm. I think we need to always try and put the country first. first yeah. The country is bigger than all of us. We will go. Okay? But the question is, what kind of a Zambia are we going to leave behind? Mm. Okay, we the primary obligation we should first of all think and see each other as Zambians first. Mm. 
and then our political affiliation and everything else second let's be stand united on this issue and be able because what is good for the country should be good for the country whether you are pf you are upnd you are socialist party and everything else that is what we should fight for okay that is what i believe is is important and that's what uh, uh, keeps me uh dealing with these issues and and like i started off by saying ambassador mm -hmm. i am privileged mm -hmm. i have the information i have the i live through this we failed to stop the injustice that was occasioned against president kaunda in 96 mm -hmm. and i'm calling upon zambians let's not have a repeat of that mm -hmm. Kaunda was prevented from, from having his name on the ballot. Let's not do that again. 30 years, that would be what? 30 years later? Mm. No. Okay, it means we have learned nothing if we allow that to happen. For me, it's the principle. It's not about Edgar Lungu. Mm. Okay? I would argue the same thing even if HH was there. I would argue the same thing if Fred Member was there. Whoever. Mm. Okay, somebody was uh, uh, just on this on this note. Yeah. Um, somebody was saying uh, there were these suggestions about me being partisan and so forth. Ambassador, I've been driven by my conviction. Correct. I have, I've had the privilege, for example, representing. But as a matter of principle, mm. I have never worked with government in power. True. Okay, mm. I've always worked on the side of the underdogs. Mm. Okay, mm. I represented President Kaunda when he left office. I worked with President Chiluba when he was in the, he was out of office, not in office. Mm. When he was at his weakest, yeah. I worked with President Sata when he was in opposition. Mm. I worked with President H H mm. when he was in opposition. Okay, mm. now I have no problem if uh, interacting with President Lungu when he's in opposition. Yeah. You see, in fact, it is when it is in a situation like this, that's when we work with them. Mm. Okay? Mm. So, I detest injustice. Correct. It doesn't matter who is involved. Mm. Okay? It is not just right. We should be able to speak against injustice when we see it, irrespective of who is involved. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, oh, Ambassador. Oh, wonderful. Dear viewers, until we have another exciting podcast, this was a special one. We just had to bring John Sangwa to put context to everything and to highlight the threats that this country faces in what might appear a simple case when it is not. God bless you. God bless our country. Shalom, shalom. All right, that's all for you today, lovely viewers. If you did enjoy the video, please don't forget to leave a comment in the comment section below. Tell me what you think about the video you just watched in the comment section below. I'll be super glad to hear from you, lovely viewers. Once again, I go by the name of Mutatim Pondum. I love you. Peace. I gotta go.